guys, and welcome back to Future Years Podcast Spot the Difference, where I'm joined today by Mark Corburn. For those of you that are returning for a second, third, fourth time, thanks for coming back and obviously listening to all of our stories and taking an interest. For those of you that are first time listeners or watchers, just to give you a very brief background on our podcast and, and what it's designed to do and, and the purpose behind it is as it says in the title spot the difference we want as a company we look at mental health we look at nutrition we look at finance we look at everything that contributes to a holistic well-being approach and for us there's a lot of times when people struggle in life with certain aspects of that and feel like they're the only ones in certain situations or they've got nowhere to turn and what we wanted to do is we wanted to speak to people who have gone through life and experienced challenges difficult times come across adversity and talk about their stories and hopefully motivate and inspire people to to make a change or to um, get a little faith that things can get better and look at it as a place where they can then reach out and maybe get help if that's what they need. So the whole purpose, as I say, is to really inspire people that might be going through tough times. And again, look at how far people have come and what they've managed to achieve out of sometimes what it can be seen as a pretty dire and maybe dark times and certainly that Mark story is, is one of that. So Mark, fantastic to have you along today. I really appreciate your time. Um, where did it all start? So take us back to childhood where you were born and bred. Yes, yes, Adam, it's, it's a pleasure. And obviously thank you, um, you know, from the bottom of my heart, thank you for inviting me on to this podcast and this video. Um, you know, thanks to technology, we can reach probably hundreds or thousands of people in the, in today's environment. So first of all, just for me, just to start with gratitude to say thank you. Thank you for inviting me along. You know, it's, it's an absolute pleasure. And certainly as a former world and Paralympic cycling champion who I guess, you know, was part of the, the legacy of London 2012 when, you know, the whole country got behind the athletes of the Olympics. You know, and I would assume that lots of your listeners and viewers probably watched the Olympics, you know, which was incredible, that epic summer of sport. However, in my opinion, it was, a, a, I guess, a great warm-up, you know, for the Paralympics. So I'll just let that sit <laughs> with, every, <laughs> with everybody yeah. listening right now, you know. Um, so, yes, yeah, so thank you. Um, where did it all start? Well, I think what I'd like to do briefly um, is just to say to all of your listeners and all the viewers watching this recording on YouTube is, you know, I was born in 1969 in South Wales. And obviously this voice that you hear, this Richard Burton dulcet tone, uh, it's not practiced. I'm very, <laughs> I guess I'm very privileged to have these incredible uh, dulcet tones as a proud Welshman through and through. So. My childhood, you know, certainly in the 1970s, was one of just the working class. My dad worked in uh, British Steel, you know, in a, in a local factory, uh, a very large factory, employed almost 13,000 people at one point. So very much like you being, obviously, you know, from the Northeast, um, understanding the heavy industries, you know, the shipyards, the steel industry. Um, in my case, it was the ironworks, it was the coal mines, the pits, and, uh, and it was a great, a great childhood. You know, I was basically uh, an only child, no brothers or sisters. And my dad, um, who was known as Mr. Nice Guy, was just, a, I, I guess, yeah, just a, a consummate gentleman. Just a gentleman, you know, a very gentle soul, very quiet. Um, but just had an incredible mindset uh, as a father. And I think the appreciation behind that is um, five years before I was born. Unfortunately, um, my mother at the time, um, who was uh, pregnant with twins, um, and, and unfortunately, she, she lost the twins um, you know, be, before they were born. So, so imagine that trauma you know, of me then being born. You know, they, they literally, um, what's the right word? Um, they almost wrapped me up in cotton wool as, as the gift that, Probably, yeah, pro probably the gift that, that, that they should never have had, you know. So, so my dad's name was Cecil, and he was known as Mr. Nice Guy. He was just, like I said, a gentleman. And my mother, Margaret, um, was a, a typical um, half Irish stock, half Welsh stock. So I'll leave the listeners. <laughs> I'll leave the, yes, I'll, I'll, I'll leave the listeners to paint their own picture there. So my mother, 
very much uh, like me, uh, very driven, very kind, very authentic, very open, very honest. And it was a great childhood, you know, certainly in the 70s, um, growing up, you know, in that working class environment where I guess people had to work really hard for anything, you know, forget having a luxury lifestyle, just had to work just really hard for the basics, you know. And just to finish on this, the town that I grew up in, in South Wales, is a wonderful uh, mining town uh, called Tredega. And if, um, if any of the listeners on the call know anything about South Wales and they know anything about Tredega, they, they will understand that the most famous person to ever, uh, I suppose, uh, com come out of uh, Tredega was a wonderful gentleman by the name of Aniron Bevan. And Aniron Bevan transformed the NHS in the 40s, you know, um, late 40s, early 50s, into the service that we now know today. And the reason why I say that is because uh, there's two reasons. One, because he was an iconic individual from South Wales who was born and bred in my town, you know, as a, as a Labour uh, constituent who spoke for the people to the people because if you go back to the 40s when the NHS I guess the the service was unreliable and people had to pay for the service yeah. whereas when an iron Bevan saw that vision and then transformed it into the service that we now know today my my whole point around that story is how many lives okay how many lives has that vision you know um, impacted in in the last you know 50 60 years uh, hundreds of millions oh, in my okay. opinion yeah. hundreds yeah. of millions so 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 that's my background um, that's me growing up um, as a young child um, just completely hooked on sport ever oh, since yeah. e ever since I can remember I've, I've kicked the football I've thrown the rugby ball I've hit a cricket ball you know I, I've almost participated in in every sport I can imagine, you know, from, as I said, the, the general sport, you know, right through to, you know, international volleyball at a later date, you know. So, so yeah, my, my childhood was, 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 um, was very standard, but just with a million memories, you know. Yeah, oh, brilliant, absolutely brilliant. And just on that sport topic, was it, were you ever in a position as a youngster to, to sort of dare to dream, to use a, a famous phrase, so to speak, of becoming a, an international, as you say, whether it was a football. I know I grew up, obviously, football, cricket, golf was all my three um, aspirations. And I think everyone from the Northeast, especially, wants to be a footballer and what have you. Did you have those dreams, as, as many do? Yes, 100%. And, uh, and even growing up when I was 10, 11, 12, started to learn the skills you know, from teachers or coaches. And I just had this inert ability to deliver the skill, deliver the skill and apply the skill in a way that I guess gave me the coordination as a young man, you know, to play, you know, rugby for the county, you know, at the age of 14 and 15, um, represent um, South Wales in athletics, you know, uh, in the 400 meters. And then, Later then, you know, after I left school and I, I attended college where I studied sports science, that then allowed me to play volleyball because I loved the impact, you know, of what volleyball gives you. It's such a fast-paced sport. So you've got the coordination, the, the, the teamwork, you know, the communication, yeah. all of those attributes the that jelly, you gain. At least probably, like, you've got to be bendy when you see them pinging you, balls from all over the place. You, you have to be flexible. So my... I guess my endurance mixed with my coordination, my communication skill set, and my speed, because at six foot one when I was 19, I was running like probably sub 11 and a half, 12 second, 100 meters. Wow. So I, I was really quick, yeah. you know, really quick back then. Um, and, and obviously quite tall and rangy, you know, for, for my age. Yeah. So two years in college studying, studying sports science and obviously other subjects. It gave me the opportunity then to represent Wales in international volleyball. And at that point, I guess I just fell in love with two things. I, I fell in love with um, enjoying sport, 
but whether you know whether you win or lose that doesn't matter taking part was the enjoyment you know taking part because that's when you create the memories the emotions the friendships um you know that you can carry with you then you know all through your life you know yeah and that's that's quite interesting really because a lot of very successful sports people and you you mean you're a gold medalist you're one of them have a, a probably approach of an attitude of nah it doesn't matter unless you win do you mean you've got to have that ruthlessness in you to want to be the best and nothing else matters but i suppose having that refreshing approach of, of actually enjoying it because i think a lot of times that enjoyment can be taken out i think that you go through certain phases where yeah as a, as a kid if there's too much pressure on you as a you're in an academy you're in a, a gb squad you're, you're being watched by the the governing body of your sport All of a sudden, there's pressure from peers, from parents to to make the most out of that opportunity. And that often, and to lose the the drive and the enjoyment of why you started playing or participating in the first place. So yeah. it's clear that you sort of stuck with that, really. I think all the all the way through, by the sounds of it. Yeah, and I think it's very important for you know for for children, you know, from five, six, seven years uh, upwards, you know, to understand that taking part is where the enjoyment comes. You know, because in some sports, there can only ever be one winner. Yeah. Okay. And if for whatever reason, you don't achieve that pinnacle, that winning status, then it's not worth carrying that disappointment with you through the rest of your life because of this reason. And this is what I, you know, this is what I, I got taught at the, at the world-class cycling program is that as long as, long as you give 100% in whatever you do, you have to accept the outcome. And whatever that outcome is, whether it's winning gold or whether it's finishing last, okay? As long as you can stand there, put your hand on your heart and say, I did my best. That, that, that for me, that's the winning formula. Yeah. You know, knowing that you did your best. That's your gold medal, knowing you, you did and gave your best. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So. How old were you then when you went to the Olympics? I know I'm going to jump back, but yeah. So I think um, the to answer your question, you know, the the dream, the dream that I had as a child growing up in South Wales, I had probably three options. Yeah. My dad, well. my, my dad wanted me to go and work in the steelworks, right. like everybody else, and I said to my dad, "Thank you very much for the opportunity," because my dad was going to um, try and get me a job interview. Um, or go and work for the council or become a policeman because those were the opportunities back then, you know, because I didn't have um, A-levels, I didn't have a degree from university. So I left college almost with the passion to live a fulfilled life of contribution and gratitude, but at the same time to dream big. And all through my childhood, I just wanted to be an athlete, you know, and most of my friends in school knew that I was good at probably most sports and I kept thinking to myself how how can I get to the Olympics how can I become a professional athlete because people like Daley Thompson you know who competed in the 1984 you know Olympics in in uh, Los Angeles and it, it just inspired me so much and I kept thinking I'd really love to do that yeah. I'd really love to train full-time you know, perform for my country. Um, and, and I guess that dream stayed with me, you know, all through my life into my 20s and 30s. I got married at 21. My um, wife at the time, we both decided then after 15 years, it was time to part company because, you know, change always happens. People change, people want different things. So amicably, you know, we, we parted company. And that led me to the age of sort of 35, 36. I had a great corporate job in South Wales um, at the time. You know, I had a nice salary, company car, you know, weekends off, which allowed me then to start racing triathlon. I started rock climbing. I started paragliding. You know, I became a paragliding pilot, I qualified. And just, I guess, Adam, I just wanted to, you know, absorb as many experiences as, as I possibly could. You know, for this reason, and I've shared this many times on stage across the world now as an international speaker, that when I was about, I think I must have been about 10 or 11, 
And my, my late dad said to me, you know, we were talking about life and respect for others, you know, respect for your peers, etc. And my dad said to me these words. He said, just remember that one day in the future, tomorrow will be your last day. And I, I, I kept thinking to myself, what, what does he really mean by that? Yeah. You know? And what he meant was quite simply this, that everything that we aspire for in life, everything we work for, you know, we only borrow because then, how can I explain this? Uh, yeah. So, so when our eyes then close for good, Everything that we've, we've acquired, the house, the cars, the shoes, the bags, the watches, the holiday home, whatever, we then hand all of that back. Yeah. So for, for people listening and people watching this video, just, just for one moment, just stop and think. Do you have gratitude for, for what you have? Just for one moment. And, and that, that moment, when I had that penny drop, the light bulb went off and I thought to myself, wow, I need to live a day of contribution, gratitude, you know, and, and to absorb and embrace as many experiences as I can in my life. And that's when, you know, I was 39 when I qualified as a paragliding pilot. And I just wanted those experiences, you know, the, the racing, the training, the working hard, just gathering so many experiences with lots of friends and associates and, you know, work colleagues, et cetera, you know. So, so that, was, that was back in, um, in 2009, you know, and obviously we, you know, we're on the, the 19th of June 2020 today. And, uh, and obviously if you go back 11 years ago, um, yeah, li life was good. Life was good, but it was because I was appreciative and I was aware of yeah. the importance of time. Just to finish on this part of the subject, because in my opinion, time is the only commodity that we cannot buy back. You know, so when it's gone, it's gone. Yeah. So it's so important to have that appreciation of, of the here and now, I guess, you know, of the here and now. I think that sort of relates quite well to probably hopefully a lot of listeners is the fact that a lot of stresses and strains come always striving for and don't get me wrong, social media is great these days and this will go out on social media and it'll be great because it'll, it'll expose it. However, a lot of pressures and sort of people wanting to think that their lives aren't successful is by mm -hmm. what they see in the media, by what they see online and what they think that their life should look like. And I think what, what your dad said there is just hitting me on the head. Do you know what I mean? Like, strip that all back at the end of the day it's, it's who you've got around you and and the memories and and enjoy life i think that's really really important really mm. important without a doubt so obviously then yeah 2009 was it so it was paragliding the big year and then the big the big well start of the new beginning shall we say that's a good way to put it what what, what led to that yeah so if i take the listeners back you know to 2009 you know, for, for some people who can probably cast their, cast their minds back, you know, 11 years ago to just to sort of put this into context. It was a, a Saturday that I was flying and it was the 2nd of May 2009. And the day in South Wales above the, the Swansea Gower Peninsula was just a, a, a day, a bank holiday weekend, the perfect day. Blue sun, you know, blue skies, perfect sunshine, and around 18 degrees, nice warm afternoon. And I was flying with the club that I was part of uh, at the time in South Wales. There were 21 other paragliding pilots all flying above the, the beach, you know, the, the Gower Peninsula that afternoon. And about 5 p.m., one of my friends, Simon, who was one of the other pilots, said, uh, you know, would you like to go back up? We'll spend another hour flying. And, uh, and then, obviously, the sun sets, the wind drops, six, maybe 6.30 p.m. That's the end of flying for the day. So me being me, I said, yeah, okay, let's go. So we hitched up 
the canopies, you know, did the safety check, and then literally ran off the side of the hillside and launched the canopies and away we, away we flew. So about 20 minutes later, at probably 20 past five that afternoon, I'm flying across the top ridge about 40 feet above the ground at about 20 miles an hour, just soaring across the top ridge. And as I pulled on the left brake to just turn very gradually, very slowly to face the Irish Sea to get then lift off the top of the hillside from the thermals, I flew into what they call a crosswind. Now a crosswind is, just for the listeners and the viewers, is it's, it's like um, it's like two airstreams that fight for the same space, you know, um, from the you know the turbulence coming up over the top of the hillside, and it's almost like um, I guess it's almost like black ice. Imagine driving your car through the winter, you know, on on very wet you know icy roads, and then all of a sudden you drive over that black ice, and you turn the steering wheel through almost you know 180 degrees. Yeah. And, and you're almost out of control. So that, that was the feeling I had when my canopy, you know, my, my nylon canopy just literally collapsed. You know, it just blew the canopy out. It's what they call a full collapse. So you can imagine, um, at the time I was 14 and a half stone, uh, you know, best part of 92 kilos, 93 kilos, 40 feet above the ground, above the grass. My canopy's folded you know what's going to happen next. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you haven't got to be a rocket scientist, no, you know? No, so, no. so I remember quite clearly now, quite vividly, you know, looking down at the grass, looking at my flying boots, and just seeing the grass coming up at a rate of knots. Yeah. And within two seconds, that slow motion feeling you get when the brain slows everything down. And within two seconds, I put my feet out in front of me, just to, to land basically at sort of, you know, 15, 16 mile an hour. And then just remember this almighty thud, you know, and after hitting the floor, the canopy unfortunately reinflated. So I got dragged fully conscious for probably around, oh gosh, probably about a, a, around 100 meters, probably the length of a football field, just out of control, almost like a rag doll in a washing machine just horrendous and just I guess yeah I guess even looking back now it scares me just yeah. you know 11 years on even just you know putting those thoughts through my mind is like you know oh. sort of wow you know so so I got dragged um I was you know tumbling smashing my head on the floor my body and then it it finally stopped and I, I, I'll never forget just just lying on the floor, trying to catch my breath, you know, when my eyes open, I'm staring up at the amazing, stunning, you know, blue sky that afternoon. And just thinking to myself, oh my gosh, that was close. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that was really close, you know, because the, the one thing to understand, Adam, is that I was in no pain. That's what I that just, was the question. Yeah, we we are just absolutely all right in terms I, I, of obviously uh, pain. I, I just fell forty feet from the sky. I've hit the grass. I've hit the floor. You know, thud. I've been dragged a hundred meters uncontrollably, and I'm li I'm now lying on my back, staring up at the sky, thinking about pulling in the paragliding lines just in case I got dragged even further. Yeah. And just thinking, I just had this calmness come over me, just thinking, why am I not in any pain? Why am I not in any pain? That's really weird. Because if anybody's listening to this podcast and watching this video, if you've ever kicked the bed with your little toe, that hurts. <laughs> That's painful. So I'm then thinking, why am I not in any pain? This was really surreal. And then I looked down my body as I'm lying on the floor. And both my legs were twisted really badly. And I thought to myself, oh my gosh, I, I've, you know, I, I broke both my legs because I couldn't feel my legs. There was no movement, no function, no pain, which was really weird. So within probably 10 minutes, one of the paragliding pilots uh, saw me crash and he looped down, came to my aid, and he radioed for the air ambulance, you know, the Wales air ambulance, who turned up 
thankfully in the boat gosh 10 maybe 12 minutes honestly it was in incredible so they arrived they did their checks um you know they, they placed the neck collar onto me very carefully and then you know placed me onto the spinal board you know strapped me up uh, very carefully and then i got airlifted you know to swansea hospital that night you know that afternoon that evening so so that's where it all started i guess you know as you said quite rightly it was not the end of one life it was just the start of a new life and i was 40 at the time so um you know when people say that life begins at 40 then Sick, yeah indeed. it definitely did for me <laughs> <laughs> yeah so so hosp hospital that night was um yeah, it was a really, really tough experience for me, you know. Being told that night that I'd broken my back, you know, I'd broken T12. I, I had a what they call a thoracic fracture where, I, as a, you know, when I hit the floor, basically my T12 vertebrae, which is the, the, the vertebrae in your spine around, you know, the level of your belly button, yeah. um, it just, just split. So you can imagine total paralysis below the waist, no movement no function, complete numbness, you know, and um, it was a dark time for me, you know, oh. really dark time. So, you know, ha having then had six titanium pins inserted into my spine to stabilize, you know, my back and being told that I'd broken my back at the age of 40 was just probably the worst news I've ever had in my life, you know. Mm. So at that time, was it a case of you might never walk again? Um, like that's it potentially for who knows who knows you yeah, know because this the, was, was just wait and see what, what happens you, you have to because obviously when you affect the spinal cord the spinal cord is like a fiber optic line yeah that goes from your brain to every muscle in your body so imagine you know and, and i got described by one of the consultants that even if somebody only breathed on your spinal cord there's going to be an effect in your body at some point, you know, from the, the way that the neuro um, signals go to the brain. So imagine having all these bone fragments smash, you know, into the spinal cord. So I had six titanium pins insert in, you know, inserted into my spine. Um, and then I was moved then to a rehabilitation hospital uh, in Cardiff called Rookwood. And and I guess, yeah, I guess looking back now, that's when the appreciation of the service that the NHS delivers was just world class. Yeah. World class. You know, being in a, in a ward with uh, six other patients who had all had horrendous accidents. You know, one gentleman had both legs amputated. And you just suddenly think, how do you cope with that? No. You know, the one gentleman opposite me, um, he broke his neck and his back. So he was a, um, a tetraplegic. So, you know, he was, well, he's, he obviously is he's a friend of mine now, but he was then going to be transferred into a wheelchair for life. Yeah. You know, for life. And, and to answer your question, yes, you, you just don't know when you affect the spinal cord what's going to happen, you know. So for 94 days, just to you know, give the listeners a, a, a picture, yeah. I spent 94 days on my back, staring at the ceiling in the, in the hospital ward, just being fed, changed, washed, you know, spoken to every day. And, um, and I think, you know, obviously we've gone through this pandemic now, you know, with COVID-19, um, you know, with the coronavirus. And, and I, wish I, could, I wish I could have reached out to millions of people to, I guess, to help them coach them mentor them through that process of change yeah from going through the methodical you know waking up to your alarm having your breakfast shower then doing your commute getting to work doing your your work and then driving home and having that lifestyle that methodical lifestyle and then when people then go through change if they're not trained in it they almost feel they can't cope yeah especially you know. traumatic change like that like it's not just like you say one like losing your job is is traumatic and it's and can cause distress anxiety emotional trauma everything but to go through a physical change to your body which could mean the end of certain things that you do daily and need for jobs for looking after your grandkids all them things 
honestly the emotional well being a people I don't know how people come through mm. that you know I mean, at that time and what they say it must be such a dark dark place yeah yeah so think th- think of this just you know picture this scene for a moment you know I had I, I, I had a really nice corporate job in Cardiff I had a nice company card a nice big salary bonuses commission all the bells and whistles and that was taken away from me literally overnight yeah but to add insult to injury I was then left with a disability for life. Yeah. It's just unbelievable. Unbelievable. So those after those 90 days then, where, where did that take you up to? Was there constant sort of diagnosis along the way of your percentages of this, of doing this, that, and the other? Was that constantly assessed, I would imagine, and then then a plan put in place to get you to where, where you need to be? Yeah, 100%. So, you know, the human brain keeps thinking of the unexamined life. We always want to know what's going to happen tomorrow because it gives us certainty, yeah. it gives us security, it gives us pleasure, it gives us confidence. But when you get that taken away from you, you know, that, that, that's even as a 40 year old man, yeah, it, it was tough, you know, it was tough to deal with. So after the 94 days lying on my back, they finally hoisted me out of bed placed me into a wheelchair, so I spent about six weeks in a wheelchair, transferring back and forth then to the gymnasium, to literally, with ankle supports, with special orthosis, learn to walk again, you know, and and that, yeah, I suppose looking back now, that that was probably the toughest, that was, apart from the trauma of, you know, thinking about suicide, thinking about, is it worth living the rest of my life, okay, is yeah, it, was it worth it? Yeah. Back then, back then, no. You know, so, so, so then when when I started to walk with a walking frame and crutches, and I'll never forget being in the gymnasium one morning with the physiotherapists and you know all of the the staff, and they have a mirror in the in the actual gymnasium, um, quite a you know a long mirror, you know, sort of six foot tall, two foot wide. So you can see yourself physically walking, you know, for the coordination, you know. And I'm, I'm, I'm watching myself trying to walk with these crutches, you know, almost like a, almost like a robot, Adam. Yeah, like a puppet. You know? Like a puppet, ro- like a robot, yeah. And, and I just broke down, you know. So it was only when I realized that I couldn't change what had happened. Yeah. So I went through the change curve, the Kobler Ross change curve that, that that I went through very, very quickly. And I accepted and understood what was going on. And I just thought, well, I might as well just get on with my life. I can't change it. I'm just going to carry on as quick as I can, you know. So I left hospital after six months, um, you know, through a rehabilitation process. Um, I actually then started walking, you know, with crutches. I did my driving test again, you know, which meant that I could actually drive, um, you know, a car safely, you know, proficiently. And, and then about two months after I left hospital, so it would have been November uh, 2009, um, I, I basically started cycling in the velodrome in, in Newport, you know, learning how to cycle with a disability because I've always been, um, you know, active in sport. Yeah. But it, it was a lifeline for me. So I gave up my job. I signed on Job Seekers Allowance. And it just became a, a new life, a new life for me, you know, just literally getting fit and healthy again. So if anybody's listening to this podcast and this video and you're in a situation where things are not going right for you, okay, things are not going right for you, maybe turn to activity, turn to well being, turn to walking, swimming cycling going to the gym doing the park run whatever just go and do something because when you start to move your whole body just improves you know and that then in turn helps your mindset you know so so then in 2010 um i was asked by um the the wales air ambulance if i wanted to participate in a, a charity cycle ride to raise money for the air ambulance that saved my life you know and i said yes of course i'd love to 
you know. And the gentleman on the phone said, well, it's, um, it's 523 miles in a week. It's <laughs> a little one then. <laughs> so I suddenly thought to myself, oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> but I thought to myself, do you know what? These people saved my life. These people saved my life. I've got to do this. Yeah. I've got to do this. I didn't even think about it. I just said yes. Yeah. So when we were on this charity cycle ride, cycling around Wales, this uh, gentleman said to me one day, and I'd never met this gentleman before, just out of the blue. He said, um, can I have a quiet word with you? I said, yeah, of course. Now this guy is six foot one, probably 19 stone of muscle. I'm thinking, okay, <laughs> where, <laughs> where, where, where is this going? And, <laughs> And, and this guy was just a consummate professional, just a gentleman. And he said to me these words, can I ask you what's wrong with your legs? Because he could see I was walking like Charlie Chaplin. I was on my crutches. And I said, yeah, of course. He said, I, I broke my back 12 months ago in a paragliding crash. I've got lower leg paralysis. My feet don't work because I've got drop foot through spinal cord damage. And he said, wow, that's interesting. Can I ask you a question? And I said, yeah, of course. He said, how are you cycling? How are you cycling? If you broke your back 12 months yeah. ago, you've got lower leg paralysis, you've got six pins in your back, both feet don't work. How? And I said, honestly? He said, yeah. I said, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but I can. Yeah. Because my quads and my hip flexors work which means I can push and pull, push and pull, you know, on the pedals when I'm clipped in. And I've got a, a really strong core. I've always had a, a really strong, you know, set of stomach muscles. And he was like, wow, that's incredible. You know, he sees people in his clinic, because this gentleman was a chiropractor. Right. He sees people in his clinic every week, you know, with different disabilities, you know, professional athletes, etc. And he said to me, Wow. He said, that's incredible. He said, I've never seen anybody with such a big engine and powerful legs, even though only half of them work, you know? Yeah. And he said, can I ask you one more question before we go? I said, yeah, of course. Now, this was June the 10th, 2010. And I'll never forget this day. I said, yeah, of course, fire away. He said, are you training for the London 2012 Paralympic Games? I said, no. <laughs> Why would I do that? He said, I think you should. So there we go, guys. Thanks for listening to part one. And to find out how that Olympic Games became a reality, we look forward to welcoming you back for part two, where we will discover how Mark continued to take diversity and mold it into success and also how he went on to inspire a generation. So please don't forget to like and subscribe, and we will see you in part two.